While we do have sensory organs, we don't experience the world directly through sensation. We have the sensory organs, sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing, but they're not perfect. Our brains take that incomplete information, filter out what it determines to be unimportant, and fills in the gaps of what it expects to be there. This is what we call perception. It's filtered reality, which could be a total fabrication, a total lie. It means that we as human beings are not capable of determining absolute fact. We can get a close approximation of what's going on out there, but as for what's actually going on out there, we don't really know. What makes it worse is that our brains can and do lie to us sometimes. So it's important to know when to believe our brains and when to know not to trust them. Which means we have to know the difference between truth and fact. Now the difference between sensation and perception could be understood as the difference between fact and truth. Now fact being what actually happens out there and truth being what we see happen out there because we don't actually know. Our senses are not good enough to know what actually is happening out there without a consensus of other people. So in terms of consensus, that's how we determine fact. A math fact is two plus two. Not because two plus two is absolutely four, it's because we as humans agree that two plus two is probably four. And if we all agree, then we consider it a fact. And it might as well be. It's just like laws and theories. If it, everyone agrees, we consider it a law. If everyone doesn't agree, then it's a theory or a truth, a personal truth. For example, let's go to a Scottish town. Now, those residents in that small Scottish town believe that 600 years ago, the English were invading their town. And they had three soldiers to protect this bridge between the English army and their town. Now, over the next two days, those three Scottish troops slaughtered one by one every English troop as they came across the bridge. Thousands of them. Now, is this fact? I don't know. If you ask the villagers if they think it's fact, yes, they'll absolutely say it's fact. Is it, but is it fact? Did it really happen? Hard to say. But it's a consensus in their town that it's the truth, so they consider it to be a fact. If everyone doesn't consider it to be true, like for the rest of the world, then we consider it their truth. And everyone has their own truth because everyone's perception is a little bit different. Now you may not believe me that our senses aren't perfect because our brains are designed to convince us that they are perfect. Because if we're sitting around doubting whether our brains are actually working, we're gonna get eaten by a bear. But once people are shown how the brain isn't perfect, they're more likely to take it under consideration that they don't see what's actually going on. For example, have you watched the selective attention video at the beginning of the module? Did you see it, the thing in the video? I won't say what it is in case someone hasn't seen it yet, but we tend to see what we expect to see. And if you didn't expect to see anything odd, you probably didn't see it. For another example of how our brains fill in those gaps that they have with stories, with information that they don't understand, let's do a blind spot test. In this test, I want you to look at the black dot in the center. Now I can't do this for everyone perfectly in this situation, but ideally, if I put, on average, if I put a color right here, most people would not be able to see it, depending on the size and location of your blind spot and how far you are from the monitor. Because in the back of your eye, where the light hits the back of the retina, there's a spot in the back of the eye where the nerves pass through the back of the wall and into the brain. Now the nerves can't see anything there, but we don't walk around with big old black spots in the side of our vision. Instead, the brain takes what it thinks would be there and fills in that information. This is why when you play baseball, or softball, or sport, and the coach tells you to keep your eye on the ball, it's because if you don't keep the ball in the center of your vision, it might enter that blind spot, and while you think you might see it, you probably don't. If you go to catch that ball, especially if it's out to the side of your head, past your ear, and it passes through that blind spot right there, there's a good chance you'll miss that ball. The same thing happens when you're doing a research study. When you expect an event, you are more likely to find that outcome, or more likely to dismiss the other possibilities in order to see that outcome. Have you ever known anyone who had a boyfriend or girlfriend? And they expected that other person to be in love with them, but it turns out they weren't. And then when they find out they're not, they're the only person who didn't see it coming because everyone else knew. They didn't see it because they didn't expect it or they expected the opposite. So they saw the opposite. 
sensory adaptation is another thing that happens to sensory organs that the brain doesn't really acknowledge. And it's like habituation for the senses. Have you ever fallen asleep to loud music? How is that even possible? That music should be keeping you up, right? Well, not exactly. The brain filters out that information when the senses get used to it so that you can get to sleep. Or when you're riding in a car and you're jostling and jostling, does it keep you from falling asleep? Probably not, because you get used to that sensation. But once you do, any new sensation, any new stimulus, like a car stopping, might just wake you up. Have you ever been trying to sneak in the house at two o'clock in the morning and you hit that creaky board and it wakes people up? It happens because they're used to a certain stimulus level and they're monitoring that while they're asleep so that if anything unusual happens, it can jostle them awake. Can you study the loud music to loud television? How would you be able to do that? In fact, 50 years ago, people couldn't do that. They weren't trained to do it. It's something that's relatively recent because we've learned how to adapt to certain stimuli. Now, is it easier for you to concentrate to music you already know? Because the theory goes, if you turned on music you didn't already know, you wouldn't be able to adapt to it as easily and it would bother you. It would keep you from studying. Nose blindness is a great one for smell. It's important because in the wild, humans smell terrible. It would be hard to smell an approaching bear if our own smells got in the way. So our noses get used to or adapt to our smells so that we can identify new smells, which can be awkward in modern society when you walk into someone's house and it smells and they don't smell it. But how are they gonna smell it? They're adapted to it. Which brings us to illusions, the optical version. Let's go to this image. Do you believe that the color in square A is the same as the color in square B? I wouldn't be asking you if it wasn't. So we're gonna take a sample of square A and draw a straight line to square B. Now our eyes are telling us that we see different colors to convince us that the brain knows what's going on. And it's convincing us to believe it. So it changes things so that we'll believe what our brain is telling us to keep us alive for the most part. Unless someone proves us wrong, we would never know. We'd never even question it. Are these two lines the same length? Well, of course they are. If they weren't, I wouldn't be asking you. Again, with the Ponzo illusion, are these two lines the same length? What do you think? What we see is what our brains expect us to see, and they will tell us what they want us to see. And that's called truth. The fact is those lines are the same. The truth is, they don't look the same. If you've ever taken an eye test or an ear test, then you know how we test sense organs. You remember one or two, and one or two, and one or two. And they narrow it until the fail rate falls below 50%, then we know it's probably good enough. Raise your hand when you hear the beep. Beep, beep. But when it gets quiet, the brain can invent signals when it expects to hear a beep, but really doesn't. So when the brain records these things at a 50% correct time, we call this the absolute threshold or the minimum stimulus that can be perceived. And then there's just noticeable difference, which is the minimum change that can be perceived. And that follows Weber's law. Then I'm not gonna test you on here. But the important thing is, the more stimulus you're getting, the more stimulus change it takes for you to notice it. To notice the difference. Now, what about those signals and stimulus that you get from your sensory organs that are filtered out before they reach consciousness? Well, it turns out a lot of them do roll around in the back of your head until they get forgotten. Several seconds. And that's what's called subliminal, which means the stimulus is strong enough to be picked up by the brain, but not strong enough to make it through the filtering. Subliminal advertising. When they put words up in like one frame of a 30, frame second and they want to see if you react to it. The study was they put you're thirsty in a movie theater frame and then they go and check to see how many people actually go for a drink. It turns out the subliminal messaging, subliminal advertising, is a lot like hypnosis in that it won't actually make you do something you wouldn't do normally but if you've got an inkling for doing something anyway, if you're feeling a little bit parched anyway, it can increase the odds of you actually going and getting a drink. As for the physical construct of the sensory organs, I'm not going to go into a lot of those. I'm just going to go into how they interact with the brain. So our eyes. 
when those pathways enter through the blind spot in the back of the retina, when they exit through the back of the eye, they split up in such a way that the left field of vision of both eyes will go to the right back side of the brain. And the right vision field will go to the left vision side. Now it goes to the back in what's called the occipital lobe, what we'll cover in next chapter, where the visual cortex is stored. As it travels all the way to the back of the brain to be, to be analyzed. A major theory why this happens, this, this bilateralization, is because dolphins can shut down half of their brain and put it to sleep while the other half of the brain keeps them alive. And in this system, they would be able to use both eyes and get stereo vision even if half of the brain was asleep. Now in humans, we don't have the ability to shut down half of our brain and keep the other half awake. However, if we did get a brain damage or a stroke or something, we would still be able to use both eyes and get some decent depth perception. So we'd know when that bear is actually charging us. Next, let's do color vision. So how do I know if the color I see is the same color you see? For example, if I say, what's the color green? Chances are you would choose a different color green than I would choose. In human vision, we have three sets of cones. Rods are for determine how much light there was, shadow, darkness, whether the sun's going down, but the cones are sensitive to three different wavelengths of light. You've got the blue, and if the blue shifted, you wouldn't really know because it's out there by itself. You've got the green and the red, and the green and the red overlap in such a way that a frequency halfway between green and red is going to show up as yellow. The problem with the most common form of color blindness is that the green and the red tend to shift around a little bit. And if the green and the red shift to the point where they're overlapping each other totally, and they're both by the same frequency, you wouldn't be able to tell your red from your green because they would be stimulating the two identically. Normal human vision operates on a system where there are three kinds of sensory cells, each one picking up different wavelengths. And this is called a trichromatic system. Now birds, like pigeons and hawks, are actually what we call tetrachromatic. That means they have four different wavelengths that they're sensitive to seeing. And their fourth wavelength is in the ultraviolet spectrum. Now this is important because if you've ever seen a CSI episode where they had a black light and they were shining the black light to get urine or bodily fluids to show up after they've been cleaned up but not very well cleaned up and because bodily fluids will reflect ultraviolet light. Well, birds have adapted to use this system to track down mice because mice, as they're running around, will leave little urine trails wherever they go. And if a bird can see the ultraviolet reflection from the urine, they can trace that trail right to the mouse. There's one person we know of who is also tetrachromatic, but she had two colorblind parents and she's able to pick up a fourth wavelength. Now it's not a superpower like ultraviolet that she'd be able to see. It's a wavelength that's in between green and blue. So the best thing she'd be able to do is figure out if a color that was the blue didn't match another color that was the blue. Not all that helpful. Now there are people who can actually see ultraviolet light. It's been noted that after certain cataract surgeries, some people can actually see ultraviolet light or reflections of ultraviolet light. But again, it's not much of a superpower because the only thing they really learn is where the dog left a puddle and people didn't clean it up. Gestalt perception. Gestalt is defined as making a whole out of parts. It's holistic. Our brains will make up visible images from just pieces that it gets. Even when, and especially when, we don't have all of the objects to complete that puzzle. For example, with this one, our brains are creating an image of a sphere, or a ball, out of just images of cones. Depth perception in humans is based on the idea that our eyes are just a little bit apart. And our brains can do these mathematical calculations amazingly to determine how far away something is based on the different pictures, the subtle different pictures that each eye sees. And it's a very common thing with 3D film these days, where they take two different cameras, slightly far apart, and then they feed one image to one eye and the other image to the other eye, and you get 3D film. 
but not only does parallax give us depth perception, our brain also takes clues from the environment. For example, if you see this square over my head, it makes it look like the box is closer to you than my head. However, if the box is behind my head, it's not really behind my head. It's not really anywhere. But this makes it look like my body is closer to you than the box. I hope I got that right. Because the part of the brain that calculates things like depth perception and eye movement is one of the strongest parts of the brain. There is one math guy who can do these amazing math in his head. Stuff that should take calculators and computers. And they did an fMRI on him and they figured out that he is using for math the part of the brain that usually does eye movement calculations. And it turns out that part of the brain for eye coordination is much, much more powerful at math than the part that we use at math, which is back in the symbolism area in your language. So the part of the brain that we use for math isn't necessarily the best part of the brain to use for math, but it's just what we happen to use, what's evolved. Here's something funny if you've never tried it. It's a flag. If you have tried this, you can just fast forward through it or skip through it. But if you haven't tried it, it's pretty cool. I want you to look at this green and black flag at that little black dot in the middle. And you look at it for 15, 20 seconds. And I'll leave it up for 15, 20 seconds. And when you stare at that little dot for 20 seconds, make sure your eyes don't roll around too much because they are tend to do that. And that flag should actually start to disappear. This is another sense of sensory adaptation. It's making things disappear because it's getting used to it. Now, if I change it to a white screen all of a sudden, what do you see? It's because once our eyes get sensory adapted and grow used to seeing it, that when you put it on white, it takes a while to revert back to normal. That white becomes the new stimulus. The one thing I want you to know about hearing is that inside the inner ear, is your hearing and your balance. It's called the vestibular system. And a disruption in the vestibular system can make people or animals sick by just moving their heads. It happens occasionally where a person will lose their hearing and not being able to move for a couple days without getting sick. And after a couple years, it might come back. It should come back. Or if you've ever seen little animals running around in circles, they look like they're chasing their tails but they can't stop, it's likely a vestibular problem. The other thing I want you to know is stereo location for hearing. Now our brains will automatically do the math that if one ear hears something at a fraction of a second before the other ear, it tells us which direction to look. A bird tweets, the left ear gets it just a little bit, a fraction of a second faster than the right ear the brain will automatically know to look to the left to find that bird. The moral of this chapter is as humans, we're not necessarily capable of knowing absolute facts because our brains often make stuff up to fill in gaps in information based on what is expected to be there. In short, none of us can be certain if we are right without a consensus of other people. Now, for people who claim that they're always right, that could be 